गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन वेलकम टू एनवी वेबिनार सीरीज ऑन एक भारत श्रेष्ठ भारत इनिशिएटिव सो टुडे वी हैव विद अस डॉक्टर शालनी ध्यानी शी इज ए सीनियर साइंटिस्ट फ्रॉम नीरी एंड शी इज फ्रॉम क्रिटिकल जोन ग्रुप ऑफ वाटर टेक्नोलॉजी मैनेजमेंट डिवीजन फ्रॉम नीरी सो शी इज ए साउथ एशिया रीजनल चेयर फॉर आईयूसीएन कमीशन ऑन इकोसिस्टम मैनेजमेंट फ्रॉम 2017 टू 2020 and she is also ipbes lead author for global thematic assessment on sustainable uh, use of wild species and also she is a, a lead author for ipbes uh, asia pacific regional assessment on biodiversity ecosystem services and asia pacific she is also a trained ecologist and uh, she has worked in a diverse uh, forest landscape uh, ranging from uh, himalaya to uh, western ghats uh, in western ghats focusing on kerala and as well as karnataka portion and she has worked uh, extensively in uh, arid regions like rajasthan as well as uh, uh, gujarat she has worked on mangrove ecosystem and also she has uh, 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 she, uh, she has worked on the various landscapes of central india so sh she is a gold medalist from uh, forest research institute uh, dehradun and she has done her uh, doctoral thesis on uh, man made uh, uh, natural and as well as man made treasures on the kedarnath wildlife sanctuary so she has uh, involved in the multidisciplinary research uh, at uh, niri and also she has been a, a think tank for various uh, projects across the globe so she, she is also working on uh, long term projects on uh, multidisciplinary research uh, associated with the groundwater depletion as well as ecosystem restoration and also the uh, biodiversity uh, inclusive impact assessment and she has uh, worked on the various projects on uh, developmental projects which, which is uh, uh, mainly focusing on uh, assessing the biodiversity impact with respect to the uh, uh, entire india and also she has contributed uh, in the ngt judiciary projects she is uh, also working on anga uh, catchment on the understanding the role of rip riparian buffers and also ensuring the river health she is uh, currently working on the nature based solution approach for the smart and uh, uh, resilient city planning she is work, uh, work, also worked on indo uh, uh, european union projects on uh, uh, decontamination of the soil as well as water uh, water usage by using the technological as well as ecological solutions so she has contributed uh, in many projects which is focus on the uh, bio monitoring aspects as well as the reclamation of the sites uh, after the mining and also uh, improving the soil condition in the region so she has a vast experience in the uh, areas of biodiversity as well as the climate change and also uh, she, uh, she has published 48 research article uh, in peer reviewed international journals so with this uh, i request uh, shalini madam to continue uh, her presentation on nature based solutions uh, and uh, uh, after the post covid situation so uh, we uh, at uh, indian institute of science uh, conduct the various webinars under the ek bharat shreshth bharat initiative so this uh, initiative is the uh, the from the prime minister narendra modi ji uh, in order to exchange the culture as well as the diversity uh, and also uh, environment uh, related uh, aspects so the, uh, under this uh, gb pant institution is also paired with uh, indian institute of science so we will conduct the uh, uh webinars uh, uh, for especially motivating the researchers with this uh, brief introduction i request uh, shalini madam to continue thank you so much bharat uh, i think it's indeed a privilege for me to be part of this uh, webinar series and i quickly went through some of them and i think many of them are really interesting uh thank you for that uh, long introduction about me and uh, and i really feel humble that i'm here in this platform i hope my slides are visible yeah, it is visible you can make it uh, full screen yeah. yeah so it's full screen now uh, uh, yeah. because i think we have around 1 hour and uh, there will be some interaction at the end of this talk also yes. so i'll go ahead with my slides uh, i will be speaking on nature based solutions and this is something that i have been working for last more than 7 years now and especially how this can reduce disaster risk both in natural areas especially high value ecosystem that are also sensitive and threatened and also uh, urban areas because now uh, across india and asia urban areas are the new hotspots of disasters be it flash floods heat uh, urban heat island or air pollution and i'll also be touching on how this can be a relevant strategy for climate change adaptation 
So nature-based solutions are not limited to disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation, but my talk will largely focus on this. Uh, this has been a very interesting slide of uh, mine that I try to share it when I start my presentation. The reason is we know there is a huge global consensus right now on conservation of ecosystems and biodiversity. The reason is you talk about disaster risk, you talk about climate change, you talk about urban, uh, you talk about uh, sustainable development goals, UN decade on restoration, forest landscape restoration, wetland conservation, or even conservation of ecosystems. At, at one place, uh, biodiversity has become a cross-cutting issue. So for targeting and ensuring that all these uh, targets are addressed, climate change, adaptation and mitigation take place, biodiversity conservation and ecosystem restoration becomes a very important aspect. So this is why there is a need that we have more awareness on these aspects going beyond academia and scientists, other important stakeholders also get involved with these kind of activities. Now, when I talk about uh, biodiversity laws, it is important to understand that deforestation and forest degradation is massive. We face it across the country and across the world. It's mostly because of exponential rise of population that has resulted to enhanced urban sprawling, mining, change in land use, and this land use change is significantly affecting almost 75% of terrestrial environment of this earth. More than 30% of global terrestrial habitat is facing habitat loss and deterioration. And at the same time, to fulfill the food and nutritional requirements of this growing population, we need more food every year. So that more food every year has to come on the expense of natural ecosystems because agriculture is expanding. We have more of intensive agriculture practices. So from since 1970, there has been an observation that, and it is already reported that uh, more than 300% of increase has been observed in food production. And that has resulted that in reduction of productivity of these lands by almost 23%. And this is because of the land degradation that is coming at the cost of agriculture expansion, excessive cultivation, soil erosion, deforestation and land degradation. Now, this is not only a, a industrial agriculture or expansion of commercial agriculture, but subsistence agriculture too comes with a cost, but not as large as uh, agriculture expansion because of intensive agriculture practices. Uh, we know that IBES has already identified drivers of biodiversity loss. So these are planet and people. These are direct drivers and indirect drivers. And these both indirect and driver, direct drivers are exerting a huge pressure on existing land uses. Uh, it's not only the relevance of these in international developments and discussions that are happening at international level. There are recent reports that have highlighted the intensity of change that is happening. The, the year 2019, when there was this uh, United Nations Convention on uh, Combat Desertification in New Delhi, there was this highlight of land restoration for achieving SDGs. And there was this De Delhi Declaration also there. It talks about the extent of land degradation happening across the country. Now, global assessment report of IBES was also released in 2019. as It also talked about 1 million stressed species that are on the verge of extinction because of the unsustainable use of wild species. The, IPCC special report on land and 1.5 degree centigrade uh, uh, report also highlighted that why we need to address desertification, why we need to address sustainable land management so that we can keep the temperature below 1.5 degree centigrade. Now, uh, the, Glasgow, uh, the Glasgow COP that recently concluded uh, in 2021 also talked about nature-based climate solutions because that was the core of uh, Glasgow Pact as well. Then 2021 uh, report, the physical science report also highlighted the intensity and loss of land and how these ecosystems are getting depleted that will enhance pressure and will enhance the, the projected climate uh, change from 1.5 to maybe 2.7 or maybe even more. So this is the current situation we have, we are already on somewhere in the mid of this pandemic and 
this IBIS report on pandemic has already highlighted that uh, human ecological destruction, unsustainable use of wild species, wildlife trafficking, land use change because of urbanization or agriculture intensification. These are all one of the reasons that will lead to more spread of zoonotics in coming years. So uh, be it uh, COVID-19 or any other virus, these are not the first or the only zoonotics that are spreading. And with the rate we are deforesting, or with the, with the rate uh, land use changes are happening, it is sure that in coming years, the situation might get worse. And it is uh, unfortunate that our coming generation will be living in much more threat of these viruses than what we are living. Now, this year becomes very significant because last year, ecosystem restoration decade was declared that is going to run from 2021 to 2030. Forest landscape restoration is already running post 2020. COP15 of CBD already had one virtual meeting in September and now in September, April, we'll be having one face-to-face -face meeting to come up with post-2020 global biodiversity framework and target. And this is very much stressing on living in harmony with nature because the answers that we are searching for, the solutions that we are searching for are in nature. This is the time when we start talking about agenda, uh, agenda that is for action and that can help us to reverse biodiversity loss and promote positive gains by 2030. So this is a massive challenge for the entire world because even when we start now, we know that all and everybody and all kinds of stakeholders, everybody around the world needs to be involved in these kind of efforts to make this a reality. If I talk about biodiversity, my experiences with biodiversity and some of the NGT cases mm -hmm. that we did, we find that biodiversity is not about provisioning not only about provisioning and all these benefits it's also about a lot of uh, other uh, 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 intangible benefit that nature gives us and human health and well-being is one of them if i see these uh, landscapes in uh, meghalaya where uh, because of uh, customary rat hole mining uh, most of these biodiversity hotspot areas are now converted into prairie-like grasslands, and that's not the character of these lands. At the same time, their loss has been at such a rate that even the water flowing in the rivers is having pH of two and three. So that's an alarming condition that if we get these ecosystems lost, if, we are, if these ecosystems get threatened, there are chances that our survival will be even more threatened in coming years. Now, nature is also and has also been supporting the humanity. And this has not been because of uh, industrial agriculture or the intensified chemical water intensive agriculture, but also a lot of indigenous agriculture by local communities where it was more forest dependent and it was more organic in nature. We had more diversified cropping patterns that were more climate adaptive. They were more feminine food. So this is what crop diversification was there by communities. And these are more drought tolerant varieties that were supporting a lot of uh, supporting a lot of nutritional security of these people who were living in remote and inaccessible location. So this is not only the cases in Himalaya, but also in Western Ghat, Eastern Himalaya, and also in the desert and semi-arid zones of Gujarat and Rajasthan. There are these riverine and wetland water security zones where the riparian buffers and these catchment areas were actually acting as a good support system for the survival of these wetlands. You see these river Ganges in the upstream or uh, this uh, uh, important high altitude wetland of Nainital. You see, now see that most of these catchment areas and uh, riparian buffers are now concretized. You have these infrastructure build up that is now even restricting the subsurface flow. A lot of developmental projects coming up, all weather roads coming up are also changing the character of these natural ecosystems. So these are kind of traits that I wanted to share with you. Now, uh, when these ecosystems, be it uh, the ecosystem in Western Ghats or these mighty mountains in Himalayas, they were also uh, helping to regulate climate, uh, not only the, the local climate, but also the climate to the, the larger part of the country. And they were also helpful for disaster risk reduction, landslide reduction. But the moment we start exploring these uh, uh, these uh, fragile landscapes by more mechanical means, there are chances that there will be more disaster risk emerging. And there were already examples in 2013. There will be many more 
in these areas. Now, similarly, we had coastal areas where we have good amount of coastal vegetation, but over the time period of increasing development in coastal areas, it is also making these um, ecosystems vulnerable. So this is one picture where you can see example from uh, of uh, dwarf bamboo species that is uh, very common. There are three to four bamboo species, dwarf bamboo species that are uh, uh, that are found at altitudinal gradient right from 1600 meters to 3500 to 4000 meters above mean sea level. But if you see the kind of provisioning benefit these species gives, it is in terms of fuel wood, in terms of fodder, in terms of storage, in terms of crop support so that you have better yields. There are n number of uh, provisioning benefits with a, with a single species that's not so commonly present. So you can assume the kind of benefit nature provides to human well-being that are enormous. So uh, Champion and Sage were the first in 1968 who gave the forest type of the country. But over the years, when it was analyzed by Roy et al., a group of a large number of remote sensing experts in 2015, they found that the original forest type of the country is now changing. There are a lot of local specific formation now. There are now more dominated plantation, degraded formations, woodlands, scrublands, managed ecosystem that were not so much prevalent in 1968. So kind of we can see that forest type of the country is also shifting and it is also getting modified because of a lot of drivers these landscapes are facing. Now, land degradation not only affects uh, ecosystems, it also affects ecosystem health. And we know uh, ecosystem health is habitat suitability for species. Ecosystem health is also its resilient ability to withstand the changes that it faces. But if any undegraded state, any undegraded ecosystem changes and we try to change this land use intensity from lower to higher level, extensive land use because of agriculture or urbanization or mining and intensive land use, there comes a stage when these ecosystems, these landscapes are abandoned because they are of no good value. The reason is we start harnessing one kind of benefit from this ecosystem and over the time period, the land has no ability because it has its own thresholds to give you ecosystem services. But if it is not conserved and protected and managed in a better way, there are chances that these ecosystem will go to the stage of collapse. So trade-off among ecosystem services and biodiversity from smaller to greater level are going to lead to ecosystem collapse. While this is a new terminology that Asian countries and even India are going to know about because we have not con considered doing any ecosystem health assessments across the country. There's one in, uh, uh, in, um, in Sundarbans, but again, that's more based on review of work that was earlier done. So there are predictions and there are projections that many ecosystems, many high value ecosystems of the country are actually facing hidden collapse. And this might be the reality if we actually take any such assessment in future. Now, it's not only uh, the climate change, intensive agriculture, but also a lot of socioeconomic dynamics that is shaping the forest ecosystems of the country. I mean, you can take the example of uh, COVID-19 when there was enormous demand of medicinal plants to build immunity. So the pressure was actually directly going to most of these natural areas and these people who are not so well to do are, are vulnerable, are poor, we're actually exerting a lot of pressure on these ecosystems to harvest these resources and sell to middlemen and further to the pharmaceutical and nutraceutical companies. Now, Akhida Jadi is another example where every year for last few decades, uh, poor communities who are living close to these areas are thronging these alpine areas and timberline zones closer to the snow line zones. And it's not only damaging these sensitive ecosystem, but it's also damaging the timber line vegetation of this area. Another is the lichen extraction, and similarly, so many other different kind of extraction that are leading to loss of ecosystem services. Now, when I talk about local socioeconomic dynamics, we should also understand that forest degradation is not only going to reduce follow of ecosystem services, it is not only going to lead to disasters like landslides or flash floods, it is also going to affect women. It's also going to affect marginalized community, their socioeconomic environment, their social environment, their education, 
their health and related aspects. So, uh, so forest degradation is not only limited to landslide, it has more far-sighted effects, and especially on marginalized communities and women. We tried to study this impact of climate change, especially on one of the keystone species of Uttarakhand, Banjo, that is Quercus uh, leucotrichophora, and it's uh, dominant across the middle high altitude of this region uh, from uh, 1600 to 2500 meter above mean sea level. And this is also the zone where a lot of villages are there. So they have their subsistence dependence on these uh, uh, species. And these are mixed broadleaf uh, forest areas. So you may find more than 50 tree associate trees present in these areas. And at the same time, there was this report by Aniti Ayog recently where they talked about loss of oak might also lead to loss of spring shed in mountain areas. So we tried to understand the specific uh, aspect of loss of uh, uh, keystone species in Himalayas and how it might lead to loss of other species also in the future. So uh, what we did was we were not using uh, not only our data of uh, the, I mean, occurrence, but we also explored almost 30 years of data in terms of where these species forests are present, what is their location. So presence only data was explored. And you can see all these small dots that are basically these uh, occurrence locations. And uh, when we simulated uh, these and we did this uh, modeling, we found that temperature, seasonality, and altitude are the main bioclimatic factors that are going to influence the future habitats of the species. And there are chances that the potential habitat of the species is going to reduce by 80%. And if we, we combine all these IPCC scenarios right from RCP 2.6 to 8.5, there are chances that this 21,000 square kilometer of area of these forests might get reduced to almost 4,000 plus square kilometers. Now, this is a tremendous shift, a drastic decline of forest area, and that will be really disastrous for the entire state. And it's not only limited to uh, shrinking of habitat, this will be coupled with the upward movement of species. Now, upward movement might look, fa look uh, fancy to many uh, people because they think at least uh, these, the species will find solace somewhere and find habitat somewhere. But the chances are that its upward movement will affect survival of many high altitude species and timberline species. Now, we had the similar kind of uh, inferences and projections for seabird thorn, again, a high altitude species that mostly present in uh, the, uh, the slopes and especially the slopes of tributaries of river Ganga. So you can consider it one of the indicator species of healthy riparian buffers. But uh, because of a lot of developmental projects, uh, dumping the muck on uh, riparian buffers, there is a, and a lot of landslide have actually damaged these habitats. And if you couple it with climate change, there are already projections that more than 80% of these probable habitats of Hippophis salicifolia in Uttarakhand are going to be lost by 2050. There will be some marginal increase if more conservation efforts are on place by 2070. But it will these kind of increase in population or increase in habitat will be almost negligible in, uh, in current conditions. Now, if I talk about India in terms of its uh, international commitments and programmatic uh, uh, and, their, uh, and their promises and policies, India in 2015 has already joined Bond Challenge that targets forest landscape restoration. So almost 13 billion million hectares were promised by 2020 and an additional 8 million hectares by 2030. Then the UNCCD declaration uh, COP was in 2019 in Delhi and Delhi declaration was released where it was targeted by the country that we will have almost 26 million hectares under Delhi declaration be planted or restored by 2030. And then came these nationally determined targets that country has promised uh, to UNFCCC. And under this, India has already committed creation of carbon sinks equi uh, equivalent to almost 2.5 to 3 billion tons of carbon dioxide. Now, so now these are the current condition, current promises, current targets that country has to achieve. So there is a lot of scope now seen uh, in nature-based solutions, something that can be a potential approach to create more carbon, potential approach to create uh, reduced disaster risk also. Agroforestry is one of them. 
and uh, india has been quite in a pioneer position there because in 2014 already india was the first in south asia that came with its national agroforestry policy and later india also committed more than 410 billion million uh, a million dollars to implement agroforestry policy in the countries that means using these traditional agroforestry system in a mainstream to mainstream them to achieve a lot of uh, climatic target uh, to enhance uh, carbon sink outside forest area now uh, policy also supports agroforestry to be included in uh, corporate social responsibility so that we have more private funding to it now it is important to understand here that uh, this pioneer effort from india was actually appreciated at sarc level sarc country level and they have developed a sarcopa south asian regional Co coalition and alliance for having agroforestry policy so that they have more efforts in conserving tree outside forest and these tree outside forest approaches are basically nothing but nature based solutions now moving uh, swiftly to urban ecosystems of the country where we know that every 10 years whenever census happens we are a lot of, we are having a lot of tier 2 3 cities that are now graduating to tier 2 cities and tier 2 cities graduating to tier 1 cities so we have thousands and thousands of these cities that are sprawling without uh, any proper management at place and that are one of the reasons that even our peri urban areas are heavily stressed because a lot of resources these urban areas are requiring is coming from peri urban areas now india already has uh, these growing smart city network of about 100 satellite towns that require and there is a huge funding going to support their core infrastructure element that required adequate water supply 24/7 electricity better sanitation better solid waste management efficient urban mobility and trans public transportation affordable housing especially targeting for poor people robust it connectivity and digitalization good governance e governance sustainable environment safety and security of citizens but in this entire discussion livability of cities green spaces urban blue spaces what is the requirement of a urban resident in terms of green spaces and how it can improve well being of urban resident has nowhere been discussed so that's one of the biggest gap of these uh, uh, i mean smart city network that is going in country while if we see the holistic version of green infrastructure we know we have this uh, potential of green infrastructure that includes both green space urban green spaces as well as blue spaces or wetlands or different kind of ways uh, uh, these uh, water bodies are there to actually not only get a lot of benefits that uh, talks about sustainability and resilience building climate adaptation disaster risk reduction but it also helps in conserving biodiversity in so many of these uh, small urban green spaces it also helps in uh, better health benefits because a lot of people use these spaces for their exercise for their morning walk for their recreation it also helps in cultural values better air quality it can help reduce uh, heat stress from urban heat islands or uh, heat waves then it can also reduce our energy consumption pattern and of course storm water management that has been issue in the in many cities because of old and poor drainage patterns now these benefits and co benefits are not limited they go and help the cities to achieve a lot of uh, urban sdgs like sustainable cities um, goal 11 or good health that's three clean water and sanitation that is six responsible consumption 12 climate action 13 life below water and life on land 14 and 15 respectively and of course in die framework for disaster risk reduction but unfortunately this entire approach has been somewhere missing in our uh, urban planning and green spaces and blue spaces are something that is mostly talked at the end of technology so that's the major thing so when i started this work sometime in 2013 we found we started from our own campus and neeri campus in nagpur is in the heart of the city we have about 48 hectare of very green beautiful lush green campus and in just two months it was so fascinating to find that my campus is about more than 2250 different plants in the campus that has more than 75 birds and these were just two months we observed these number of 
interesting birds, more than 50 different butterflies, many moths, many mammals. We are rich reptile diversity in our campus and many other macrofaunal, mesofaunal elements that we really uh, bother about. At the same time, these forests are effective carbon sinks. So we went ahead and did some carbon stock assessment of some of the urban uh, forest of Nagpur. We also tried to see how it can help in wetland management, heat uh, island reduction, and can help in uh, recreational and health benefit. Now, these are some of the studies that we were doing, but now we're trying to expand our work we did recently uh, for Faridabad and now do it for Mumbai also. And of course, our, some of the colleagues in Bangalore are also collaborating. And we're trying to see how we can actually scale up nature-based solution for mainstream resilience in Indian cities. So now there is a lot of momentum already on ground and we are trying to explore a lot of ways, urban foraging or home gardens, how we can have moderated the relationship of people during um, stay at home orders in 2020, how it was so beneficial. I see a lot of people actually went back to their uh, backyards or they went back to the kitchen gardens they start producing some food in their balconies so this was the kind of connection these urban residents were developing to reduce the stress of being at home and then of course india has already a lot of scope of urban agriculture that we need to actually find more opportunities to explore and good thing will be if we involve right from the beginning school level or youth level where we can use these leftover wasteland as we call them that they are they are actually not that wasteland to grow a lot of community food through community gardening. Now, like any other city in the country, uh, Nagpur was at one point of time one of the greenest city in the country. So if you see the imagery from 1990, you can see it was such a green uh, city. And even if you come, you'll find a lot of streets are still very green. But over the time period, what has happened that concretization has uh, enhanced. There's more build up area in the city now. We have more barren land, decreased vegetation, and even our blue spaces, a few of them have also shrunk a, a lot. So this is the condition, and this is just a representative picture uh, or imagery, but I'm sure most of the cities, be it Tire 2, Tire 1, or Tire 3, are going through the same fate. Now, there's a huge demand supply gap if you talk about India. Access to public green spaces is still not sufficient. So there is a, uh, already a uh, guideline by World Health Organization that recommends that at least nine meters square, meter square of space of green space should be available for each individual. And that's an urban, ideal urban green space situation. So that should be about, uh, and it should be about a value of 50 meters square per capita. But what has happened over the time period, the second important thing is that every individual should have green space at around 300 meters of its household or it should be at least accessible within 300 meters. The Indian UR UDIP guideline also mentioned and these guidelines came in 2015 and they said that at least every person in the urban area of India should have 10 to 12 meters square of green space. Now this disparity is high. If you see uh, at least people who are well to do have access to these green spaces. They have access to not only public green spaces, but they have also access to private green spaces. Some of the government offices are very green spaces, like one of the Miri campus or BNIT campus or Seminary Hills in Nagpur. But if you try to check how the situation is for uh, local uh, common people in the city, it's there is a huge uh, disparity. There is a huge demand supply gap. And uh, we try to understand that what might be the reason behind this demand supply gap. So uh, in 2020, what we did was, in 2019, actually, we tried to understand the projections for increase in population of Nagpur. So that's high. It's 2022. We are already ahead of what I have projected. And uh, then uh, we tried to see different garden spaces, uh, public gardens available in Nagpur. So you can see there are more gardens in the West. And most of these are, uh, if you see these smaller gardens, these are more, more in uh, eastern part. but in comparison, West is one of the greenest part in Nagpur. Well, if you compare it with the other zones like Central Zone, North East Zone, North and South, there's a huge, huge, uh, I mean, uh, supply gap. So people are actually 
taking long journeys, they are traveling a lot to actually get these benefits in other zone of the city. And at the same time, because they have to take longer journeys and they have to, uh, uh, to reach these places that are few kilometers far from their areas or colonies where they are residing. So that takes a lot of their time and that's why their visits are not so frequent. So mostly during weekends or once in few weeks or twice or thrice in a month is only the time when they can actually they can access these uh, garden spaces. Now we also try to see uh, which of these uh, gardens are or playgrounds are actually there on the map of Nation, um, Nagpur Municipal Corporation, but are not there on ground. So we actually found some of the gardens that were on the paper, but were not. They were actually encroached, or they were now turned into dumping grounds. So now this is again a common situation. And if you see the per capita urban green space zone in uh, Nagpur, you'll find. While 10 to 12 meters square is the national guideline by UDIP, we have hardly 2.32 meters square in the richest zone, uh, in the most greenest zone that is in Dharampet that is given or that is allocated for local residents. Whereas the Nehru Nagar, Ashi Nagar, Lakshmi Nagar, these are again green spaces. They are considered to be green spaces. Uh, Lakshmi Nagar is one of the uh, greenest ward in Nagpur, but again, most of this greenery is isolated in campuses. So many of these campuses are not also accessible and open to com common people, people because of a lot of security reasons. So this is kind of a scenario and I'm sure this is uh, quite uh, uh, same in different cities of Na Na Maharashtra or India. Now we also try to see some of the lakes like there is this example of Sakardara Lake and Sukravari Lake. So these were the natural lake formations in the city and they're still there but if you see the uh, the blue green ratio you'll find a lot of these spaces are now actually concretized you don't have these wetland buffers and because you don't have these wetland buffers it's very uh, clear that subsurface flow to these uh, lakes might be restricted and because it is restricted there are chances that in future these lakes might disappear so this uh, infrastructure buildup has actually encroached these spaces and has eaten up. We also tried to do one survey in 2020 when um, COVID just struck. So this was before COVID and we could reach around 100 wards of the city and we tried to ask basic question to people of uh, Nagpur in different wards. Are they, are they I mean, satisfied with the services of green spaces? So you can see there are more than uh, more than actually uh, almost 50 percent of people in the city those who think that we that they don't uh, agree with they strongly agree that they don't have sufficient green spaces in the in the city of Nagpur for them uh, and based on their different responses so we had around 20 questions different question what kind of benefits they are harnessing what kind of reasons they have to actually visit their places these green spaces and most of them were uh, going to these places because they have health reasons so they wanted aesthetic beauty to be enjoyed so uh, based on these responses of this report we actually based on people responses we have identified the green zone the orange zones and the red zone so the uh, green zones according to people are places where there is enough uh, sufficient greenery that can support people then there are orange wards th those that have not sufficient greenery available that can benefit the demand or that can fulfill the demand of local residents and there are the green the red zones that are uh, more alarming zones and this should be the proper uh, priority and that is what we uh, uh, communicated to Nagpur Municipal Corporation because this report was for them to to plan their strategy to plan their green greening strategy based on what local people think what the local residents have to uh, what their requirements and demands are so uh, so this was one of the study that we did and based on our work in natural ecosystems and uh, urban ecosystem we found that this concept and this approach is not so simple this entire situation is not so simple that needs not only ecologist or botanist or zoologist perspectives and scientific understanding but it is a mo it needs much more sophisticated and understanding of contemporary terms of the subject from a multidisciplinary approach to actually address this problem. So that's how we started uh, 
uh, this nature-based solution and ecosystem-based approach. Nature-based solution was initially, this term came in 20, 2012 in European Union program of Horizon 2020. And that was basically to address uh, urban heat islands and flash floods in fast-growing European cities because a lot of concretization, they all also have similar kind of problems. Now, uh, this approach is a, now a subject in itself where the heart and soul of this subject is not conservation, but addressing societal challenges. So these societal challenges can be safe environment, food report, water security, food security, your uh, disaster risk reduction and climate adaptation and climate mitigation, change mitigation. So there are an array of approaches right from protection, issue specific conservation, infrastructure, green infrastructure, near natural infrastructure, management and conservation of ecosystem and restoration, forest landscape restoration, area based conservation. So there are n number of ways uh, nature based solution proposes and provides to address societal challenges. And the benefits are human well-being and, of course, biodiversity benefits are co-benefits that one gets. So uh, this approach not only talks about conservation, it actually puts people and their natural resources in the center of decision making. So one, if I have to plan for a certain kind of a solution, I have to first understand the societal challenges. So it's a more of a systems approach to implement nature-based solution. It seeks balance between conservation and use of biological diversity. It's not only relevant for professionals and practitioners, I must say it is relevant to all kinds of stakeholders. It helps to identify different uh, changes in ecosystem and enables them to plan adaptive strategies. So now CBD has considered it important. Uh, Ramsar Convention has acknowledged it. Glasgow uh, nature-based climate solution given by Clim uh, Glasgow Pact has considered it in, uh, relevant. Then your uh, uh, Sendai framework is also considering ecosystem-based approaches. So these approaches are, are basically to protect, sustainably manage and resources, not only natural, but modified ecosystem, as I mentioned. Societal challenges, the heart and core of these nature-based solutions. And it tries to search ways to work with the ecosystem rather than relying on conventional engineering solution. For example, if there is a flash flood and you would put up a protection wall that can be a small term solution a short term solution but if you club a gray engineering solution with a gray green engineering solution that can be a long term strategy to protect uh, communities so while i uh, support a lot these uh, gray green engineering solution i also give it a wise thought to consider using a good mix of gray engineering solution that can be a short term solution because you know these green engineering solutions or plants, they take some time to grow. So for that particular time, you should have some kind of supporting system to help these kind of risk reduction. Then, of course, it has a lot of uh, momentum right now in 2020. Uh, if, uh, the IUCN Commission on Ecosystem Management has given up, uh, provided these global standards. And again, if you see in the heart is societal challenge. Second important area is design at scale. It is either at landscape scale or water scale or uh, seascape scale. Then what kind of bio economic feasibility is there? What kind of biodiversity net gain is there? And what kind of inclusive governance will be there? Inclusive and interactive governance. So these are the core areas. And of course, it addresses trade-offs. It also addresses adaptive management and helps in mainstreaming sustainability. Now, uh, this is a very important slide that helps you understand what are the differences between engineered and uh, nature-based solution. So while engineered solutions are only targeting disaster risk reduction or hazard mitigation, nature-based solutions or ecosystem-based approaches not only give your main targets of disaster reduction, hazard mitigation, climate adaptation, they give you a n number of core benefits that are creating good carbon six sink conserving biodiversity, improving regional climate, improving water and soil protection, and of course, recreational and uh, aesthetic benefits of nature. And of course, the key important aspect is because you are involving communities, it also helps in creating sustainable livelihood. Uh, so as I mentioned in the previous slide, there are different ways and this uh, umbrella approach has different ways to implement nature-based solution, it has restoration, engineering, green infrastructure, ecosystem-based management, and so on and so forth. 
and these are well acknowledged by international agreements and discussions also but what are the global challenges to nature based solutions so what we uh, this recent report that was released uh, um, on the state of finance for nature says that monitoring restoration or nature based solution is a key global challenge we are implementing but we are not monitoring what we are implementing financing because a lot of public finances are supporting nature based solution and connecting people with restoring land so if we actually want that nature based so solution should help us to address the planetary crisis of disaster and climate change we need to triple the investments by 2030 and increase this by fourfold by 2050 and it also means that public funding that right now is about 86% going to uh, nature conservation and restoration it needs to be supported by private sector and there should be more finance and engagement from this sector to significantly uh, scale up nature based solution and at the same time the third and most important thing is connecting people because government cannot be everywhere forest department cannot do everything it has to be civil society it has to be academic organizations ngos women youth intergenerational participation in these kind of efforts now we have tried to do a, a, a couple of things by involving corporates also we have also tried to involve international community and also uh, uh, local youth through their action research program to make sure that ecosystem based approaches concept is well understood and is also mainstream in the way they are addressing most of these uh, uh, their, i mean challenges in the corporate world uh, especially for example mine wards are there or uh, uh, reducing uh, pollution so these can be a very good benefit uh, for uh, corporates as well as other stakeholder groups now we came up with these two important publication i'm sure uh, very first in the country the first was uh, though there has been a lot of buzz on nature based solution because it's a very uh, global south north concept but if you try to see a lot of examples you see a lot of examples in different ecosystem and different landscapes that are success stories there are failure stories and also what kind of uh, gaps are there what a kind of limitations are there so we kind of uh, uh, comprehensively uh, collected all these stories and uh, edited in this volume and presented it 2020 and this one is on blue green infrastructure especially focusing on urban areas and this is going to be released sometime in a week or two so this can will be a interesting read and how we can mainstream these uh, nature based solution and these approaches in sectoral planning and implement them now the challenges for uh, india is uh, first of all we don't have multi criteria optimization what has to be implemented where so that kind of optimization has to be there and academicians can play a very good role in that poor understanding of species we understand now species but we don't understand their function their role uh, and their presence in ecological succession patterns their socio ecological interlinkages so that needs to be very well there and that's why a lot of academicians and scientists can play a very good role we try to replicate solutions but in that course of replication we forget that different agro climatic zone different biogeographic zones are very different in the country and in india we have so many different and dissimilar uh, these zones so there has to be customized approach nature based solution stresses on a uh, very customized approaches to different societal challenges so something that very successful in jammu kashmir might not be very successful in telangana so that kind of approach has to be very customized at at place shortage of legislation and policy that incentivize uh, ecosystem restoration or nature based solution even if people at their level are doing a lot of uh, urban gardening or uh, greening of spaces or restoration of patches in peri urban and natural ecosystem we don't find any compensation or any support or incent or in i mean uh, any kind of support that goes to these people so that can really help to motivate people in, in i mean mainstreaming these approaches in their uh, implementation approaches lack of coordination so con convergence is a big issue where uh, funds divert and get to address similar kind of problems so if this lack of coordination can be i mean that can be addressed there are chances we can achieve better uh, models of nature based solutions in the country monitoring post plantation care is again a, a, i mean a gap area we also don't do a lot of uh, research especially long term research on these uh, 
restored areas or where we implement nature based solutions so this is where we really need to uh, push up our efforts so we came up with this uh, climate sensitive restoration planning a hybrid knowledge framework as we not only respect uh, by accepting the uncertainty of climate change we need to accept that scientists can provide a lot of things but at the same time it is important that we involve indigenous and traditional ecological knowledge system indigenous people and local communities in exploration and identification of species that can withstand climate change and then mass propagation of these species because many of these species don't have proper mass propagation protocols so communities can really help and this is where we can help identifying industries and corporate who can actually lend support to support sustainable land restoration last but not the least citizen science we have seen tremendous uh, role of citizen scientists in wildlife studies or phenological studies and climate change but this is something if they can be involved in restoration and post restoration monitoring and involving of course uh, artificial intelligence this can be a game changer for the country and of course the big data that is generated i have seen maharashtra forest department generating this big data so this can be very much useful for a lot of researchers now the four r approach should be followed uh, that uh, talks about multi criteria optimization that talks mm -hmm. about indicators for identification and mass propagation of native species by communities and of course training communities so that they are capable of understanding that what they are planting and how they can be uh, getting benefit out of it understanding how they can calculate carbon and tree carbon stock by easy method so this can be a game changer and training a lot of good manpower in the country and of course it is in science based involvement for restoration and monitoring approaches so we kind of developed one such model in uttarakhand long back we started sometime in 2009 and by 15 we developed this fodder bank model so we, this was basically to reduce drudgery of women who don't have enough resources and have to walk longer distances but at the same time it was iucn that had identified that our model of women drudgery to reduce deforestation is actually helping to for slope stabilization because after himalayan tsunami what happened that this particular village cluster in upper kedarnath valley helped to restore soil it, it this was the area where there was less soil erosion less landslides and this was what benefited communities and then uh, of course alternative benefit of selling milk to local people and then getting resources right right uh, very near to their households was something that was very socio ecological in this entire uh, practice so the approach was environmentally sustainable it was addressing societal challenge it was cost effective and there was a lot of benefits that were harnessed by the community so these kind of approaches and of course scaling up nature based solution for urban areas especially addressing heat islands and floods for floods are two important areas along with reducing uh, uh, air pollution risk so by planting the trees that are more air pollution tolerant that are having also the capacity of creating these buffer for noise attenuation can really help uh, take up this approach at this next level so the conclusion and uh, key takeaway from my talk can be we need to understand and realize the risk of climate vulnerability and understanding that disasters are going to increase in with frequency and intensity both in future and also realizing and accepting that we actually have less time than we think we also need to understand that we need to involve not only academicians scientists urban planners but everybody in the community and in uh, in the area where we are implementing it understanding what actually nature based solution is what science is and how best we can identify best approach for any specific societal problem and ensuring there is not only public but also private funding coming to it so that can help us improve resilience and capacity to learn and organize to address climatic challenges and mainstreaming nature based solution not only in sectoral policies but also trying to find ways how we can enhance their uh, implementation on ground can really help so with this i thank you and uh, i hope my talk has created some uh, kind of understanding about nature based solution and will help you thank you once again bharat for inviting me i am yeah. open if there are certain questions thank you so much yeah thanks a lot madam thank uh, you have highlighted various as aspects of urbanization and also the role of trees in uh, water retention 
and also you have highlighted especially the impact of the deforestation in himalaya and also uh, need for uh, understanding the sustainable developmental goals and uh, how the approach for the sustainable planning and uh, also you highlighted the climate sensitive planning uh, that is a very important uh, and need of the hour so i think uh, our participant might have uh, benefited with your vast knowledge and uh, we have some quest uh, questions also so i just uh, read out uh, please uh, uh, try to uh, answer that so there is a question from varun sharma thanks for the webinar and uh, can you provide your opinion on eia 2020 amendment thank you uh, varun i think that's a important question and you are taking me uh, from science to policy level and to a different dimension of eia i think uh, uh, amendment uh, is relevant but at the same time because it uh, doesn't captures very well the public participation so something this is one of the drawbacks of this policy and this amendment so i think that should be play in place because once you take uh, opinion of public and their right to actually respond to these kind of eia you are actually taking half of the right of the people to uh, understand the kind of risk they would have and you are not giving all them also chance to be part of our decision making so yes this is my brief response on eia 2020 amendment so this needs not to be so diluted the way it has been diluted because country is already having shrinking forest areas and at the same time budgetary guidelines are stressing on tree outside forest areas it's like two different things you are asking to cut down forest on the name of development and stressing on creating forest outside forest area so why not we go and protect those uh, refuges and uh, biodiversity that's already existing in these pristine ecosystems thank you thank you uh, there is a question from manasvi kiran <clears throat> madam can you highlight the impact of monoculture plantation in urban and forest environments so i have already stressed this in my talk also i think uh, a lot of industries and we keep talking about them that whenever they go for their compensatory forestation or whenever they go for their mine spoil restoration they go for this approach of monoculture plantation using exotic species because most of these species are very fast growing high biomass yielding in a very small span of time you can not only see them visibly as good canopy but you can also see them with the remote sensing tool uh, but at the same time there are a huge pressure on ecosystem be it urban areas or forest environment so this should be discouraged the reason is most of these exotic species have their own allelopathic impacts and if they are there for a long term they will have adverse impact on the kind of biodiversity that flourishes in these environment you have this very good example of pinus roxburghi or uh, the cheer pine in uttarakhand that's native species but because it was during colonial times it was planted and i mean promoted across the region there are now areas where it is actually encroaching the uh, mo moist temperate broadleaf areas and that's a huge concern because if these moist temperate mixed broadleaf forest areas go as i highlighted my oak study there are chances people will not get their subsistence requirement there will be the ecosystem services and the benefit will be jeopardized so these kind of hello 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 yeah i think there was some issue with yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, there was slight uh, this yeah. problem in your connectivity yeah okay uh, so can i go to next question ma'am yes please yeah there is a question from asha priya it is possible to establish more places with green infrastructure despite of despite of a high population like in india what are the challenges one shall face while attempting to build one i think that's a very important question uh, because the reason is we have very high population density in urban areas if you see and these are the areas where we need urban uh, green as well uh, blue infrastructure 
and so the best suggestion asha can be if you choose uh, what suits to your requirement for example in nagpur also or even if you see in delhi there are certain areas where you have spaces for uh, good uh, avenue plantations or creating good parks and green spaces but there are highly populated areas like uh, markets of chandni chowk or in bangalore there might be certain areas so these are areas where we can talk of having vertical gardens and spaces green walls because instead of having nothing we should have something and in one of our publication we stressed on like somebody asked about eia amendment in eia there is a clear uh, uh, i mean a clear uh, policy that if you are doing uh, a non forested uh, forest purpose diversion of forest area for non forested purpose you have to actually go for at least uh, compensation of forest area similarly if you are having high rise buildings or some colonies in urban areas make sure that at least 33% of these areas are green because if they can develop infrastructure they can also make them green so unless and until there are stringent policies in place people are not going to get them and second thing is those who are getting it like in kerala you see you are having rain harvesting infrastructure integrated with urban areas so having them uh, and some kind of subsidies if there are there to support i think uh, this can really help well and the challenges are of space and i stress that so you have to choose what kind of solution and what kind of green infrastructure has to be implemented it has to be chosen based on what kind of land environment and what kind of space availability is there but yes there are many uh, opportunities and solutions to this yeah uh, i think uh, it's a continuing question yeah is it uh, it is possible to seek balance between the conservation and, and use of biological diversity and bring it equilibrium despite of high demand for food and space with growing population like india i think uh, yes uh, it is possible to balance between conservation and use of biodiversity because if you see a lot of work that is being done even when you grow food even in previous times you have these agroforestry practices you have these home gardens you have these kitchen gardens and these are also the places where you get a good number of pollinators uh, pollinating benefits you also get a lot of recreational benefits so we should not uh, limit ourselves uh, in terms of ecosystem services to only provisioning benefits we should keep it open to other benefits the the health benefits that we get so there are uh, there are def definitely limitations and challenges but it's not impossible to balance both of them but in that in that course of taking the decision we need to understand that at what what point we have to say yes to the uh, the development of project and at what level and at what time we have to say like this is the limit and we need to find alternative solution and that's why uh, option of alternative is already there and always there in such projects okay uh, thank you another question from atanu gosh ma'am is it uh, agroforestry is economical uh, economically viable for farmers yes it is it's it's not something that we are creating or scientists are creating for farmers farmers are doing this for millennia it's not only in india or at one part of the country it is uh, across the world you go to latin america you find uh, uh, traditional agroforestry systems you go to uh, northeast india you have these jhum or uh, slash and burn agriculture practices so there are different kind of such agroforestry practices and they have been there because farmer wanted them their agriculture to be supported by something so instead of exerting pressure for fuel wood to forest they are getting these benefits if they wanted fodder instead of going to the forest area they are getting benefit from agroforestry so there are n number of uh, these approaches and they are very much created by indigenous knowledge systems of farmers they are very much economically viable the only thing that is constraining right now is these farmers don't have felling rights so if they don't have felling rights to the tree and sell and get the timber value so that becomes one of the major reason to actually uh, not consider agroforestry so that has been a deterrent uh, but i'm sure in coming years there will be policies where uh, people and farmers are promoted to plant to fell to sell and replant and regrow the trees that can be a better approach to uh, economic viability of agroforestry okay thank you so much i think uh, there are no more questions so 
we we'll just wait for uh, two three uh, some thirty seconds. If there are any questions, we will try to get back. So participants, if you have any questions, please post in the comment box. Yeah, there is a question. Uh, can local self-government claim carbon credit for plant, uh, planting trees because the trees are capturing car carbon as uh, woodstock? Now, this is a very interesting question. We recently were in discussion with uh, some of the agencies who are actually going for selling of carbon credit. If you see the current context of Indian government, we are definitely trying for some models, but most of these models of selling carbon credits are supported by either an external agency like World Bank or SIDA. There were two models. One was in Uttarakhand, one was in Meghalaya. So definitely, uh, we are uh, India wants more uh, uh, carbon stock outside forest areas. But if you see the stand of government of India, they're not talking about finances. They're not talking about selling these carbon credits. And the discussion that we recently have, uh, there is a common perception that uh, selling of carbon credit means you every individual would get some good amount of dollars in their pockets. But this is actually not the reality. So these communities and the people, even the self local self-government, are going to get money that will be for the entire community. But this will be for improving their sanitation, improving their water access and all those things. It should not be highlighted as uh, money going to every pocket. But uh, I think there are chances. And let us wait, wait for the next COP where finances will be discussed and a more robust model of how uh, developing countries Will be benefited out of it can be uh, discussed so for the time being i think uh, this uh, uh, answer will help yeah sure sure certain uh i think there are no more questions uh, on behalf of envy's center at uh, indian institute of science i thank you very much for uh, uh, sharing your uh, knowledge in uh, knowledge with our participants uh, under the egg bar stretch Bharat initiative so we look forward to have the interaction in near future also so, uh, uh, participants, uh, I request everyone to subscribe to the uh, NVIS IAC uh, YouTube channel so that we'll try to communicate whatever the webinars conduct under uh, this initiative. Apart from that, uh, we have also archived so many uh, 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 lectures from, from the experts. So, you can go through the uh, YouTube and uh, you can uh, watch the lectures there. So, with this, uh, I thank uh, Shalini Madam for uh, uh, sharing her knowledge. So, th thanks a lot, Madam. Thank you so, so much, Parag. Thank you. Thank you. So with this, we are ending the session. Uh, uh, we will look forward for the uh, another session, uh, uh, and uh, we will communicate to you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.